Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and in this episode we are going to be looking at some car sensors, specifically this sensor cluster. I hope it's going to be cooler than it looks. Okay, so modern cars, it's very common to have a lot of optically actuated sensors. Now that's automatic headlight dipping, uh, where you switch between main beams and dipped beams. You can have lane assistance, where it warns you if you're drifting off a lane. Uh, you can have, actually have adaptive cruise control, which might try and keep you in a lane. Uh, you can have automatic windscreen wipers. And all of these things are through some mechanism, an optical sensor. And this cluster is one of those sensors. Now this is what goes sort of in front of the rear view mirror. So on the driver's, from the driver's perspective, if the rear view mirror is here, for me in the UK at least, then this cluster would be just in front of it, sort of attached to the inside of the windscreen. And from the outside of the car, that looks like a sort of a black part of the, the windscreen with a little, often sort of trapezium shape cut out of it. And you'll notice it. it. A lot of cars have them by default now, just for the higher end models that have got these features. That cluster already exists, whether it's populated or not. I guess the thing I'm trying to work out is how computationally heavy is this module? Because the connector on the back is one, two, three, four, five, six, 12 pins. But I don't know how many pins are gonna run back over CAN bus or some other interface to some computational module on the car, or whether all of this is done on board and there's just a CAN bus connection to, let's say, the braking servos for the automatic braking assist that says, apply the brakes now. And the only way I can think to find out is by taking one apart. So let's have a go. And this particular module is from a Mitsubishi Outlander. I would suspect that these are probably mass manufactured and are probably you'd find that a lot of cars are compatible with this one even though this particular one is branded to mitsubishi probably it's very common to find that nobody likes the responsibility of manufacturing their own kit cost savings come from bulk production so this is all going to feel very very modern and flashy but did you know the first cars to have the automatic braking assists were Volvo, I think it was the V60s or C60s, and it goes way back further than you would think. There's a great video uh, of, called Volvo City Safety. Uh, I'll put a link in the description or something um, where one of the engineers is talking about it. And it's that classic machine vision overlay on, on the data. And, it just looks exactly the same as using like TensorFlow or any other sort of machine vision framework built into a car. Okay, I was kind of being curious because this, this bit here kind of looks like it's potted in over this camera. That camera is lifting up with it, whereas the, lens, the stereo, what looked like the stereoscopic lens is staying behind. So I wonder if there's like a lens that I need to... There's a ribbon connector. Oh yeah, never getting that back in. So why would you pot this camera in? And what do we have down here? So that camera was on a ribbon connector. <laughs> this feels like less of a problem I might have in the UK, but definitely a problem you might have somewhere in the, in the world. Because if you imagine this is in your windscreen and it is black plastic, you can see how that's going to get very hot very quickly. So the fact that this has got heat sink on the back to dissipate heat, and this is all sort of thermally bonded down shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Oh yeah, there is some processing going on here. I was hoping we'd get this out, but uh, I think this is a big infrared LED, which coupled with that Fresnel lens, can you see the shape of this lens? It's almost like Fresnel lenses, if you imagine like a really big, if you imagine a really big, thick curved lens like that, rather than having to have that massive glass in the middle that's sort of inches thick, they take that profile of all the curves, chop them up and bring them closer in to mean the, the overall 
lens uses less material. And this particular lens looks like it's also maybe trying to focus the light across. So I think this part is for the automatic windscreen wipers. Okay, so I've got this glass of water here and you can see if I sort of start here, then you can see my finger through the glass. And that's a transition of air glass air. But if I move my finger down, so the transition is now going water glass air, you can see that my finger is invisible and I can touch that glass or not and you can't see it. But if I actually wet my finger and touch the outside of the glass, the transition is now water glass water. And hopefully you can see just there, my finger. Now that's frustrated total internal reflection. And that is the process that cars use to see when automatic windscreen wipers should turn on. This single camera at the top, that sort of slightly potted one, is the one responsible for picking up that infrared light. So it's scattered inside the windscreen from that lens. So it's bouncing sort of forward and back here. And then a raindrop hits it up here and is reflected back into that IR camera. This is a second hand module which is responsible for safety in a car. I don't think after I've taken it apart, anybody should be using it just in case. So I don't mind destroying it to sort of ensure that nobody would use it. What I'd like to do is get that camera away from its optics. Normally, or at least I'm kind of used to seeing sort of a pair of screws holding the optic assembly onto the CCD or the board with the sensor on it. But this is very, very well glued. This kind of potting material is not like a solid resin. It's, it, it's almost like it's hot glue. Very specifically designed camera module where it's got that ribbing, which presumably interfaces with this glue material just to hold it really specifically in place. So there's the first optical camera module. Oh, wow. There's three sensors there. I hadn't expected that. So these two lenses were covering three sensors. They're tiny little optical sensors. Sorry. <laughs> I was just feeling how warm they were to the touch um, to see if they were plastic or glass. They do appear to be plastic. Lovely optics on them all the same. Really, really surprisingly wide sort of fisheye lenses. But three sensors I hadn't expected. I would have thought there would have been two offset to give that stereoscopic depth perception that you get from stereo vision. Two major ICs this side and all the heat hungry ones on this side. So having had a look uh, I didn't find any information on that IC down there. This one is a, an automotive a high voltage power management board, which makes a lot of sense. On the top side, uh, I managed to find that this is memory. This is a 32 bit automotive microcontroller, which has an awful lot of power in it just for a microcontroller. And as far as I can work out, that's not even the power hungry one. Interestingly, one of the IO that this has is CAN bus, which leads back to what I was saying earlier, that most of this processing seems to be done locally. And just those CAN bus commands, and probably some backup uh, sort of hardwired open close type contacts are going through this 10 pin connector. And lastly, this, this obviously hot thing down here. Now that's a separate silicon die with a heat spreader on top. And although I can just about read, I think I'm reading the right part number off of there. When I search for what it is, I don't get any useful hits. I'm not sure what this is, but my gut tells me this is possibly an FPGA set up to do the machine vision. I'm gonna drop high resolution photos of all of these ICs over on the Element 14 community. Uh, I didn't have luck finding all of them. If you think you can find the data sheets, Head over there, get the high resolution photos with all the part number details on them, and let me know if you find the ones that I can't, because I really appreciate that. And the other thing that's interesting to me is there's, I would guess over here, an unpopulated dip package, probably. Over here, you've got a pair of 10 contacts, but on the other side, just there, you've also got this um, ZIF connector that's missing. Now, I wonder if that's like a programming and debugging, or maybe even, 
an additional feature which is available in some models but wasn't in this one. Again, if you've got access to the automotive industry or some inside knowledge, please head over to the Element 14 community and let us all know. It's a really strange configuration of Vs around the screw holes and I can't work out if that's for increased ground plane inductivity or whether that's heat dissipation. Well, I hope, much like me, you're kind of surprised to see this much raw processing power in a very specific part of a car, just there, or there if you're in countries that drive on the other side of the road. Um, but if this is being used as safety systems and mission critical, and it's got that much processing power just there in that module, it makes me wonder how much processing power do modern cars have? I mean, I've never accredited an ECU, an engine control unit, with sort of a particularly high power, uh, but maybe I'm not doing them credit. Maybe getting hold of an ECU might be a fun teardown for the future. If you have some insight or maybe a teardown suggestion you'd like to make, don't forget to head over to the Element 14 community and let me know. I hope you've enjoyed this one. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.